amongst the Republican models, the one that has just got 73 votes is clearly preferred. Now, when you bind those two together, it would be a travesty in common sense terms of Australian democracy for that proposition not to be put to the Australian people. This was the best republic that the best brains of the Republican movement could come up with and it could only get 45% support. And that is a, a credit uh, to the healthy scepticism of the Australian people when faced with change for change's sake and a dud model republic. Thank you, Judge. And thank you, Peter. Thank you for coming into the lion's den. And, uh, and it wasn't too bad, was it, Peter? And congratulations on your latest book, Victory at Villa's Depression. He's not out of the lion's den yet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you for contributing in your literary way to popularizing the history of Australia, which is very important. A few years ago, I was at, uh, going up to my car at a car station at Bondi Junction. I was going up the ramp, and I saw a figure ahead of me. He was obviously blind drunk. He was staggering along. I decided the best thing to do was to shoot past him, slip by him quickly. And then, uh, then my blood ran cold when I heard these words, Hey, Dave. <laughs> and... Uh, we had a conversation, and uh, he said, uh, you know, I'm a Republican. And I said, that's very nice for you, Bob. And uh, I, I, <laughs> he, 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 said, uh, he said, but what's the name of that other crowd? I said, you mean constitutional monarchs? They said, yeah, that's the ones. They said, nearly keeled over. He said, if they've got one thing, they've got, and he almost keeled over, they've got stability. <laughs> And I thought immediately, I saw in his eyes, this was after the referendum, that he had voted no. That when he went into the, into the quiet of the polling booth, he weighed up all the considerations, he saw that there was a problem, he probably smelled a rat, and he decided the safest thing was to say was the constitutional monarchy. I want to try and answer quickly three questions. First, why am I a monarchist? Second, haven't we done all this before? And thirdly, if there is a problem with the Constitution, is it really the Crown? Well, firstly then, why I am a constitutional monarchist? First, my first reason is the Queen and the Royal Family. They are so superb. Their theme is service. And the service of the Queen goes back to her 21st birthday when she promised to us that her whole life, whether it be long or short, would be dedicated to our service and the service of the great family to which we all belong. That is something which has marked the Royal Family. But my second reason is allegiance the oath of allegiance. I've, we are all in allegiance to the Crown, but I have twice taken the oath, once to become a lawyer, once in the army. You don't wave aside an oath of allegiance. You don't break it unless uh, there's some very good reason, because I do hope that when people go into court and they swear an oath, they keep to that oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Of course, about two-thirds of the politicians, two-thirds of the city politicians at least across Australia, decided that they could break the oath that they had so clearly taken. And if Keating hadn't so foolishly and unconstitutionally removed the oath of allegiance for immigrants, we might have had the experience of seeing people put their hands on their holy book and swear allegiance to a woman, and that might have sorted some of them out. <laughs> But my third and my most important reason is the Constitution. The existence of proper checks and balances on power, because Acton has expressed sublimely the, the very essence of our constitutional system, and that is the proposition that power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And if we don't have proper checks and balances in our Constitution, then we will fail. Neil Ferguson, the professor from America and England, has made the point, and I think more and more historians and philosophers accepting this, that it's not our colour, it's not our race, it's not where we live, it's not even our, our geological wealth. 
what makes a country successful are its institutions. And that explains why a country like Switzerland, a republic incidentally, but a, a country like Switzerland is so very successful without any geographical assets. It's the institutions. And you only have to contrast us with Argentina, both the wealthiest countries in the world at the time of federation, and Argentina has gone down. Her system has collapsed in so many respects. She has moved from the first world to the third world. A minister in the Menem government, the Argentinian government, appeared on Four Corners in 2002, and he was asked precisely about this. He said, if Argentina were like Australia, and had British institutions, we would be as good and as wealthy and as strong as Australia. Uh, we are one of the seven oldest continuing democracies in the world. Five of those are constitutional monarchies. Two are republics, real republics, the United States and Switzerland. But only one model only one republic, one constitutional model has ever been successfully exported and lasted for a long period of time, and that is the British Westminster system. The American has never successfully been exported for a long time and avoided serious problems and coups and revolutions. The Swiss has never been exported because it is too idiosyncratic. Only the British has been successfully imported and lasted. When you go to the United Nations Human Development Index, which measures countries against their wealth, their health and their education, although constitutional monarchies are only 15% of the countries in the world, they make up 60%, 60% of the top countries in the United Nations Human Development Index. And that's just about every year, 60%, and they are only 15% of the countries in the world. What the Republicans have to do, what the Republican movement has to do, is demonstrate to the Australian people serious reasons why they should change the Constitution. So I come to my second point, my second question. Haven't we seen this all before? This, this is not the first Republican movement. The first was in the 19th century, which was to create a white republic outside of the empire because they wished to control Asian immigration into Australia, which resulted from the gold rush. They thought they couldn't do this with the British, who had a very liberal approach to, to immigration. They thought we had to be a separate country. And uh, this was what they did, but they didn't realize that with federation, the federal parliament got the immigration power. It was taken away from the British and given to the Australian Commonwealth. At the time of federation, among the leading public figures of the time, only one was a Republican, George Dibbs, who was the Premier of New South Wales. And Banjo Patterson wrote a poem about him. This G.R. Dibbs is a stalmat man who was built on a most extensive plan and a regular staunch Republican. But then, but then Dibbs did what Republicans often do. You know, when, when, uh, when royalty comes to Sydney, even minor foreign royalty comes to Sydney, I frequently have to send out a warning to supporters of ACM, and that is never stand between Republicans and visiting royalty, otherwise you'll be knocked over in the rush. <laughs> Well, when, when Dibbs went to London, he accepted a knighthood from Queen Victoria. And uh, Banjo Patterson continued in his poem in the bulletin, the Tories laughed till they cracked their ribs when they think of how they purchased G.R. Dibbs. <laughs> The third great Republican movement in this country came from the First World War down to a few years ago, and that was to turn Australia into a Soviet People's Republic. It wasn't very successful, except that at the end of the war they had a majority on the ACTU, and they undermined the war effort, which you'll see in Hal Kolbatch's brilliant book on this. The fourth Republican movement was the Keating-Turnbull Republican movement, which was supported by 
about two-thirds, more than two-thirds of the politician, and almost all of the media, with the exception of Alan Jones and a few other Thank individual commentators. <laughs> and, as you know, we now have the fifth movement, which is the child of the Keating Turnbull Republic. You have no model. It's as if you're marching down the street, Peter, saying, we want a republic, leading your band, saying, we want a republic, but we haven't the foggiest idea what sort of republic we want. There is a sixth movement, which we'll put aside, and that is those in this country who want an Islamic caliphate. One of the problems, of course, is that many, of many people on our side, as mentioned in our charter, think that we're already a republic. I went to a lunch a few weeks ago and Warren Mundine came up to me. I didn't realize what a big man he is. And he, he embraced me and he said, what you said was so right, a republican monarchy. I said, it wasn't exactly that, it was a crowned republic. <laughs> and that's a long theme in Australia. Sir Henry Parks thought we were a republic. Cardinal Moran, whose statue graces St. Mary's Cathedral, said that this was the finest republic in the world. And Montesquieu, of course, said that the British system is a disguised republic. John Howard and Tony Abbott come to that conclusion too. But this desire to remove the crown, of course, has put us in the situation we are today. I wrote a book at the time of the referendum, and on the back I put this note, and I referred to another problem, and that was about the greyback beetle eating the sugar cane in Queensland. And so the, uh, the Queensland scientists and the Queensland government imported Buffo marinus to deal with the problem because they thought Buffo marinus would eat the, uh, the greyback beetle so the sugar crop would be saved. They released the uh, Buffo Marinas into Queensland. The problem was they hadn't thought about the fact that uh, the, uh, the greyback beetle couldn't fly. Uh, uh, the greyback beetle could fly, but Buffo Marinas couldn't fly. So this was the beginning of the cane toad disaster. So I thought, what's the pro what's the, what, is, there some, uh, is there some equivalence of the cane toad disaster with what's happening today with the Republic. And I thought there is, so I wrote a book called The uh, Cane Toad Republic, and has on the cover an enormous cane toad sitting on the Parliament. So the, the Republicans have to give us the reasons for change. They have to tell us. They started out wheeling out all of their celebrities to tell us why we should change. Al Grasby said, well, the monarchy is the reason why we had a recession and why we have so much unemployment. Michael Lynch from the Opera House said, the monarchy stifles art. So Anthony Mason said he became a Republican because of the Bodyline series in cricket. Janet Holmes, of course, said Asian governments are confused. Sally Ann Atkinson said the French government's confused. Neville Rand said a republic will boost jobs and invigorate spirits. And the editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, an Irishman, said, I won't become an Australian citizen until you become a republic. All of these are foolish, foolish arguments for change. They didn't work. So what did the Republicans do? They fell on a term so obscure, that is head of state, they fell on this term so obscure, it, dis it didn't appear in the first edition of the Macquarie Dictionary in 1981. Nobody was talking about head of state. And they devised this formula that only in a republic could you have an Australian head of state. Well, most people didn't realize that they had a head of state until then. And they listened to the republic and say, well, you've got to become a republic to get an Australian head of state. Head of state is not a constitutional law term. It comes from diplomacy. It replaces the previous term, which was prince. And it is governed by international law. And there can be no doubt that the head of a state of Australia, held out by the Australian government, accepted by all foreign governments, is the Governor General of Australia. We have an Australian head of state. In fact, during the election when Malcolm Turnbull was criticised for not being present when the remains of servicemen from Vietnam were brought to Australia, Malcolm Turnbull said, oh, I didn't need to be there. The Australian head of state 
the Governor General was there. So even Malcolm has come to the view in Australia, the head of state is the Governor General. At the time of the Constitutional Convention, John Howard gave the Australian Republican movement a blank check to devise the best republic they could, to call in their best Republican brains and to produce a Republican model which would be acceptable to the Australian people. But the Keating Turnbull Republic which they produced was highly flawed, but you wouldn't know it from the Republican media. I was at uh, one of the problems, one of the particular problems of the model is that it would have been the only republic in the world in which the Prime Minister could have sacked the President without grounds, without, without notice, and without any right of appeal. This republic would have turned the President into the poodle of the Prime Minister. And I was discussing this with Ted Mack, the Republican, independent Republican at Corowa. There's a conference at Corowa. And uh, I said, I can't seem to get this through to the Republicans that they've got a terrible model. And Ted Mack said, that's because this is precisely the model they want. They want to undermine, this is the Republican movement, internal, they want to undermine and take away the authority of the Governor General. That's their purpose. Well, when the model, when the model was produced, there was a forum held by the University of New South Wales. A number of leading academics went there, mainly Republican, and they all came out with condemnations of the model. They said it was flawed, unworkable. This is in the University of New South Wales Law Journal. A weak model, politically motivated dismissals were possible. The independence of the president was not assured. It was cumbersome and unsatisfactory. It was patently defective. There were serious deficiencies. It would damage the essential essences of the democratic system. How many moments? Thank you. It is not a proper Republican model at all, said Professor Brian Galligan. It is a monster, an absolute monster, said Pat O'Shane. And uh, Harry Evans, the Republican clerk of the Senate, said, no other country would be so misguided to, as, as to adopt such an unbalanced model. They were scathing, and none of that got into the media. It's in the University of New South Wales Law Journal. None of, it, none of it got into the media because the media didn't want the people to hear these criticisms. Kerry Jones and I, with David Elliott, were coming to this parliament to present a submission to the parliamentary committee at this time before the actual referendum. We wanted the question changed so that the method of dismissal was included in the question, not just the appointment, just the method of dismissal. As we were arriving there, Malcolm Turnbull came out and he looked very worried and he was followed by reporters. Later on we learned that he proposed two changes to the question. One change was to remove the word president and put in its place head of state. But when we heard the second word he wanted removed, we found it very difficult to believe it. The second word that Malcolm wanted removed from the question was the word republic. And that caused such mirth, even in the Republican newspapers, that a few days later he had to withdraw it. But what, was he, what were his focus groups telling him about the word republic? And what will they be telling you today, Peter, after the American election about the word republic? I think, I think the word republic is on the nose. And as you know, as you know, in the referendum, notwithstanding the media, notwithstanding the politicians, 57.4% indicated they were happy with the existing system. Those include those who didn't vote and those who voted informal, and 54.8% voted no. Every state voted no. 72% of electorates voted no. And uh, the argument of the politician Republicans is, keep on voting till you've got it right. There have been 12 major votes and inquiries in Parliament to try and work out how to turn Australia into a republic. So my final question was, is there a problem with the Constitution? And if there is a problem with the Constitution, is it the Crown which is the problem? Now, I would suggest to you 
I've come to the conclusion that over the last 50 years, most of the problems in Australia have either been created by or exacerbated by the politicians, most of whom are Republicans. The Crown is the institution of the Constitution which works and works smoothly, efficiently, cheaply and superbly. God save the Queen. <laughs>